Today, uh, what I want to do is get you to think about secrets. So while we're beginning this conversation, to think about a secret that you have, a secret that you've never told anybody, a secret that only you know. I mean, you have to at least know your secret. Okay, so it can't be even a secret from yourself, so don't do that. Uh, so have a secret. I'm not going to ask you what your secret is. I just want you to be thinking about the fact that you have a secret and what you've done to keep that secret. If you have a long secret, it can be better. But it needs to be a secret. Because for me to explain to you what a secret really is, I need you to be on the same page with me with the secret. It would be better if the secret were quite rude. <laughs> Seriously, quite, let's say, ethically dodgy. That'd be helpful. We'll get a better sense of how it operates. So it's not like there's a secret that you want, you want to be on a diet, but you secretly eat in a candy bar. That, that doesn't count as a secret. Okay? The secret has to be one that if someone found out about it, it would really not be good. Something like that, that level of the secret. And you have to think to yourself, with that level of the secret, everybody have a secret in your head? Is there anybody without a secret? Good. <laughs> okay. So you realize that we're all guilty, right? So we already start from the point of view of disaster. We already, and I'm not talking about, you know, um, the problem of, um, what do you call it, original sin. I'm not interested in sin. What I want you to think about is a secret that is so terrible that if it were revealed, it would undo you. That level of a secret. Now, I'm hoping that everybody has a secret like that. Not because I want you to be plagued, but because I want you to get a sense of just how difficult this next part of the lecture is going to be, this next part of the section of the course. The, court, the, the, the title tonight is around how one keeps a secret. What have you done to keep your secret, to keep your secret safe, to keep your secret so that nobody else can get to your secret? How have you protected your secret? How have you kept it concealed? If it's an old secret, how have you kept it so concealed that only now, by raising it with you, do you remember that you have the secret? Is, you know, how good are you at concealing your secret? How good are you at camouflage? There is a secret. You are to tell nobody here, or in fact, nobody ever. You will never be relieved of this secret, sorry. You will never have to reveal it either, hopefully. This is how powerful it is. Now, Leotard makes the comment that I st stated at the very outset of this course. A person who does not know how to hide does not know how to love. Just pocket that. Now, remember the first things we talked about in the first lecture. The enlightenment. In one word, not two, not so peri audi. In one word, what does the enlightenment mean? No. Leap. 
or nothing. Right? Got all that? And we know that to access that immediate requires what? Intuition. Intuition. Good, John. You're John, right? Soon, if you give me your bank details. Long ago in the U.S., uh, there was a show called Soupy Sales. And Soupy Sales, anybody ever heard of Soupy Sales? Okay. It's not even because you're uh, too young to know what Soupy Sales is, it's because you're also not, not American. But Soupy Sales was a, uh, it was kind of like, um, it's kind of like a Jimmy Savile actually, or whatever. Anyway, he, he ran all these uh, children's uh, TV shows, and he was very popular. And uh, one day, he said to the children, um, now, it was, it was first on TV, it was big, and he said, you know, uh, are you home alone? And uh, if you are, please get up and shut the door and lock it. And now go into your mommy or daddy's wallet, take out $5, and send it to Soupy Sales. And he got thousands of dollars. <laughs> you are more than welcome to go into your parents' wallets right now, or anyone you know, send it to Johnny Golding. <laughs> he was fired. I'm just kidding. Okay, so the immediate is then sublated. Remember that fabulous word? Sublated. Or sublation. And it creates what? Perception. Nope. Intuition. Big intuition. Concept intuition. Why is it big intuition? Because that form of the intuition is not your opinion. It's the full concept. It's the full <clears throat> concept. And that form of intuition comes back around, forms the ground, to make meaning of the immediate. Right? Remember this little process that we were doing? So you have, you start with right here, right now. You start with the here, like Dorothy. You're on your Wizard of Oz path. Where does Dorothy start looking for things? <coughs> she starts right where she is. The is. She starts with the is. The is is immediate. The immediate can't be mediated. It's immediate. In order to access it, according to Hegel, you need intuition. Intuition sublates the immediate. So the fullest form of intuition has the immediate in it. And that comes back around. Does anybody have a clean accent? <laughs> Lovely, I wear black. Okay. Alright. So we have here the ground, which gives meaning to the two sides. That creates this movement. So what you have to remember now, we have exit. Exit implies movement. Oh, very good. Very good. You do not have to go into your wallet. <laughs> Exit implies movement. Thank you very much. Movement, this notion of movement coming from Newtonian physics that all sentient anythings need to move. That's their essence. Movement is the essence of being human. Very different than prior to the Enlightenment thinking. We know that this movement doesn't really go anywhere. It moves, but only in the sense that it's not a solid block. The block has energy in it, let's say. So that this ground is giving meaning to the thesis and the antithesis. That comes back around this whole movement. So against intuition is what? Don't look at your notes. Two words. Sense certainty. Okay. Then sense certainty when pitted against this side is, this is now the sort of the vacuous side, the not side of the fuller side, the thesis side. All of this gets sublated into sense certainty. That creates perception. perception. Ow! What's with perception? It creates <laughs> big sense certainty. See what a, how difficult one week can be? Okay, comes back around, creates sense certainty. That gives meaning. Then what gets pitted against that? Perception. Perception. Okay. Then all of this gets sublated into perception. 
that creates big perception. Big perception. Yes. Good. Got a secret there. So we have big perception. Right. And what's on the other side of perception? So perception includes now all this other stuff. It includes immediacy, intuition, uh, sense certainty. It includes all this this other stuff that we're talking about. So, so if you're talking about perception, and I, I want to ban anyone saying in tutorials or anywhere, I, I like that piece of work, or I don't like it, or that work doesn't speak to me, or my perception is, or my, no. Now on, we only use perception when you really know what you're talking about, and at the moment, that's not the case. So perception, sorry. I say that with love. Okay, so perception, is then what's on the other side? What's the abstract antithesis of, of the fully formed form of perception? Understanding. Yay. Understanding. Very good. And then all of that gets sublated into the understanding, and that becomes big understanding. Right? So now we know that if you understand something, it has all that stuff going on. The sensuousness of certainty. The, the, the hunch that it's going on, the fact that you understand it because it's immediate. It's all part of the understanding. And then that, that whole thing, whole mess of understanding being, it's big understanding here, is next to what? What's on the other side of that? Knowledge. Knowledge. Very good. And that gets sublated into knowledge, and that whole business becomes big knowledge. Big better knowledge. Now, I think with Simon, because he was being particularly alert last week, probably every week, said, but what's on the side of what's on the other side of knowledge? And I jumped up and down and said, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get outside of knowledge. Nothing's outside of knowledge. What if outside of knowledge. What if the thing that you can't really reveal, because it's not able to be revealed, sits on the other side of this just outside your grasp after you've done or you know or you've been involved with something? Where does the secret lie? That's what I want you to start to Just keep thinking about this little secret and the little secret that you have. I know it. The thing about the secret, and the thing about Kierkegaard's use of the secret, and the thing about, let's say, Abraham and Isaac, who's keeping the secret. And anyway, what was the secret in their case? Does anybody know the secret? What was he going to do? <laughs> he was going to murder his son. Okay, it's a bit of a secret, you know? So it's, it's kind of bad, I would think. And, and, and what made this not revealable, because as you may know, if you've now finished reading your Kierkegaard, you know that Kierkegaard was not saying, why the heck didn't he reveal it? Was he hearing voices in his head? He was basically saying that he wasn't able to reveal it, not because authority told him not to do it, not because God said, don't tell anybody. He couldn't reveal it because it wasn't revealable. Is that making sense? See, something that's really a secret is not able to be told. It's not able to be told not just because it's horrible and therefore in the telling of it, it's damaging. It's not able to be told because it's not tellable. So is it knowable? It's not knowable. Except it kind of is knowable, since you know everybody in, your, in this room admits to having a secret. Right? Or some secret that you have. So you know you have a secret. So it's knowable at that level. It's graspable at that level. If I ask you to hide, what's your best way of hiding? How do you hide a secret? I don't know. I say I don't know. You say you don't know. A secret that you know. OK. What's your way of hiding a secret? Not 
Not going to bed? Not going to bed. Oh, not going to bed. Not going to bed, yeah. To lie. To lie. Not just not to tell it. Not to tell it. And how can you not tell a secret? How do I know that you're not telling me a secret? Because if I know, I could probably tell if you're lying. No, that was stupid. How do I know? How could you do this? Well, just be as You could forget your secret. Although Abraham, as we know, was having issues. He was all capitations. Not know it's a secret. Well, Abraham knew it was, he knew not to say that he was supposed to be murdering his son because he knew it was going to upset a few people. And probably they would prevent that from happening. And since God was telling him, you go murder your son. So he does know. See, see the other side of knowledge. So he actually say that the secret, secret, is on the other side, as it were, of knowledge, which, of which nothing can be on the other side of knowledge, so this is already crazy. We know that it can't be separated, so that by saying that something can't be separated, that it's stuck together, means, means primarily and only that knowledge is involved with your secret. This whole bit is involved with your secret. Knowledge is involved with your secret. You could split it the other way, secret involved with knowledge. <coughs> okay, now I'm going to put that on hold. I'm going to read you a little passage, which I was actually going to read last night, but I didn't get around to it. So I'm going to read to you now. This is from Nietzsche. Here's what he says about the secret. Very famous passage. It's the God is dead passage. It's one of my all-time favorite pieces. Oh, well, actually, everything in Nietzsche is one of my all-time favorites. He writes, um, where is he writing this? Okay, he says, okay, he says here, from the madman, have you not heard of that madman, says Nietzsche, who little lantern in the light morning hours and ran into the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. As many of those who do not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Why? Did he get lost? Said one. Did he lose his way like a child? Said another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage? Has he immigrated? Playing chess somewhere. I added that. <laughs> Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his glasses. Whither is God? He cried. I shall tell you. We have killed him. You and I. All of us. All of us are murderers. What did we do when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving now? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually, 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 backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there any up or down left? Are we not straying as though through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night and more night and more night coming on all the while? Must not lanterns be lit in the morning? Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell anything yet of God's decomposition? Gods do decom decompose. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we, the murderers of all murderers, comfort ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred game shall we have to invent? Mm -hmm. Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we not ourselves become God simply to seem worthy of it? There has never been a greater deed, and whoever will be born after us for the sake of this deed, he will be part of a higher history than all history hitherto. 
Here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners, and they too were silent. I stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern on the ground, and it broke and went out. I come too early, he said. My time has not yet come. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of man. It's a secret. So it wasn't so much for Nietzsche that people were afraid to stare into the, to the abyss, to think about all the things that could be wrong. It was rather that we're not afraid enough. It's not so much that people aren't afraid to have secrets. It's that we're not afraid enough. For Nietzsche, the chemistry of change is always connected with a life force. Murdering it, not murdering it, playing with it. It's connected with a life force. Life force connected with power. Power with mastery, mastery with change, change with life force, and then a repeat of the pattern. Chemistry of change connected with life force, life force with power, power with mastery, mastery with change, change with life force, and then a repeat of the pattern. intimate chemistry of change. Change with life force. Life force with power. Power with mastery. Mastery with change. Change with life force. And then a repeat of the pattern again and again and again. This, and not transcendence, was for Nietzsche the eternal return. Always returning in intensity always returning with not being afraid enough, always returning this intensity, this will to power, as he would call it later, as we'll get to later. Now this is very different than the Hegelian mood. Nietzsche is saying that this abyss, this staring into the abyss, is not enough. Is knowing that on the other side of knowledge there is nothing. You need to know that that nothing is alive. That nothing operates as a secret. It might be useful just to call it a secret, so you know that if you call it nothing, you don't think of blank. But it's a funny form of a secret. It's a secret that has fear in it that has sexualness in it, that has evil, cruelty, has all these things all of us have mentioned to themselves. And you know that if you lose sight of the secret, you've lost sight of life force. Abraham could not reveal the secret, in part because he was afraid in part because he wasn't afraid enough. In part because who would believe him? In part because it was too dreadful to reveal. Now, think about it with your own secrets. Or let's say just one good secret. I've got the whole book, maybe a whole bunch of them. They're tiring to carry them all around have the secret, it forms you, or to put it slightly differently, it in, sorry, in, I am, informs, informs you. It lets you know something. It informs you, but also informs you. It forms you, it informs you, but it's also not necessarily a part of you. It's a part of you because it's your secret. It's not a part of you because no one sees it, no one knows it, 
and a lot of times you don't even know it. Now, this is what Nietzsche, but particularly Derrida, which you were asked to look at today on Gift of Death, speaks about in terms of a singularity. So the new term we learn today is singularity, but you need to understand that we're not learning about singularity in this abstract, dry, brittle sense. Singularity is the secret, but the secret is involved with this fear. It has something to do with, it's a visceral, it's visceral. It has blood and guts in it, it or something. It's whatever you can think of that has is visceral. And it has something to do with ethics, the dark side of it. Now, I just want to make a little caveat. The caveat here is to get you to remember that there's a difference between morals and ethics. So I just want you to remember this little point, and then we'll get back to our little telos, our secrets, and this and that. A moral, a community moral, is similar to a rule. You can make up morals. You can break those things. You can become immoral, not moral. You can break it. Ethics, in this way I'm trying to help you see what it's about, it's like a system. It's not that you can't break ethics either. You can. It's harder. Ethics are like the ground, whereas morals are like a position. A law, I mean a law like a rule, it's like a rule. Ethics are closer to like, let's say the law of gravity. You can jump out the window and you can think to yourself, I'm going to fly. But it doesn't matter if you think you're gonna fly. You're not going to fly, unless you have something to help you fly. All the great drugs in the world are gonna not prevent you from going down in <coughs> gravity. Ethics is similar to this. Ethics is like a law. You can break the law of gravity. You can break an ethical environment. But it forms a ground. But it's a ground. The ground that it forms is sort of like the ground that we were talking about in the Hegelian model here, where it allows you to go on your path and to deal with it until you come across your secret. And when you come across your secret, what happens? What do you do with that now? Break it? Don't break it? Do you hide? Do you run away? What do you do? How do you deal with it? Kierkegaard says, in order for you not to go completely off the rails, you have to learn how to suspend ethical. In suspending the ethical, you must learn its colorly, its sort of other side of the suspension of the ethical. Does anybody remember what it was? Simon re reacted to it very vigorously last week. Certainty. Not certainty, although he did react to certainty. Sorry, Simon. Not <laughs> what keep putting about it. Submission. you submit to? What do you, what do you go down on your knees for? Anything? In the religion, Jewish religion that Abraham was putting forward, there's the argument, you never go down on your knees. You only go down on your knees to God, and even then it's, you know, a negotiation. In fact, Jews are one of the only religious people that negotiate with God. It's always been the thing about that. What makes you submit to something? Gun to your head? What do you submit? Passion. <laughs> yes! <laughs> That's one reason. It's one. And what's the passion that makes you submit? Wait. Think about it. What, what do you mean by passion? Like what you enjoy. I'm thinking about what you said about art. You know, submit to art to mm. be able to be an artist. And if it's something that you really enjoy, you have to be completely, like, give in completely to it to be able to comes to burst in it. Is submission 
enjoyable. Not always. Not always. <laughs> Sometimes. I'm glad you said not always as opposed to now. <laughs> Submission is enjoyable to a certain point, especially if you are in the hands of a master who you figure knows what they're doing. Right? Because if you can submit to someone who kind of knows what they're doing, or to something that knows what it's doing, then it's less scary, even though it could be really horribly scary. But you see, there was no safe word in the, in the little trial with Abraham. He couldn't say to God, okay, uncle, or you know, pineapple, or something, and then God was like, no, okay, I cease being this sadistic creature, and you're gonna kill, you know. Abraham's submitting, so what's he submitting to? What allows him? Faith. And if we're in a secular environment, what would you call that? Conviction. Yes. It's conviction. Courage. What, what is conviction now? I mean, there's a lot of people that have a lot of conviction around here. Let's think about Mitt Romney, for example. Again. Um, Romnesia. He's got a lot of conviction. What makes his conviction wrong, for example, and other convictions right? What makes your conviction right? Have you given up a lot to become an artist? Or whatever you've given up to become an artist? Ain't nothing to what you will give up. Pound of flesh plus. Now, I told you that. That's a big secret. I told you a secret now. Secret is, you want to be an artist? You want to know stuff? Then take everything you have plus. You willing to give it up? You really willing to give it up? Now. <laughs> now, my job. <laughs> Think about submission. It's OK if you think the rules of the game are fair. But what if the rules of the game aren't fair? What if in submitting, you're forced to submit. Would you submit if you if you could not submit under a forced situation? Someone had a gun to your head, and you decided, I'm not going to submit. What do you think would happen? Die. Die. Okay. If you go into a situation where you can submit, you might submit. You could wanting to submit, or anyway, you're not wanting not to submit, so we're at that level. You're not saying no. You're not exactly saying yes, but you're not saying no, so you're sort of like that. If you're at that level, what happens with your practice? This is what Nietzsche, for me, what Derrida is trying to get to. We want you to understand this question of submission to a mastery that is based in a passion as opposed to an absence. But it's not a passion or absence that is um, with rules. And it's certainly some that might take you away ethically from whatever you consider to be right because there's like a bigger thing at issue. The bigger thing at issue would be what for you? What would be the biggest thing at issue? What would you, what would make you do something really wrong? Passion, right, Chelsea? Yeah. Okay. Anybody other than Chelsea into like following the passion? Nope, you're on your own there. <laughs> nope, there's like three people. <laughs> there's three people that are following the passion. You follow it wherever it takes you. Yeah. Sure. Anybody else? Uh, passion's got a very emotive context to it. Yes. Murder. Yeah. And I'm just thinking there's something, there's something bigger and better than passion. What is that? Which is the non-secular word for faith. Okay. Why, why doesn't passion work for that? It's too emotive, too broken, too personal. Okay. Anybody else have other words for that? So this is a tougher lecture, so I'm not giving you the ways. I'm not giving you your vision. Yeah. We're getting there. Vision? Vision. Mm -hmm. So the possibility of something else beyond where you are currently. Progress. So does that mean that you're going to fall back into the telos? Uh, trust. <laughs> trust. Trust. 
Trust. Yeah. And predictability. Trust is bigger than passion. Trust is bigger than passion. For me. Love. Sure. What? Love is. Love is bigger than trust, and trust is bigger than passion. <laughs> I mean, uh, love is uh, can make can make you make mistakes. Love can make you can help you or can can help you can help you make mistakes. <laughs> That's right. Okay. <laughs> and uh, is that a good thing to make mistakes? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. We're getting warmer here. I feel like I'm full of tea. I'm now becoming a dentist. Here. <laughs> Okay, let's try it again. Let's what go. is the realm of courage? Courage. So courage is bigger than love, is bigger than truth, is bigger than passion. Trust. You know trust. We're back to trust. So if you're in a, in a, in a, in a world, let's say a power game, uh, trust has very little to do with things. In what world? Power. Right, does it be fundamental? Okay. In what way? There's nothing more powerful than trust. Okay, that's tautological. So. But, <laughs> but, but what is it about trust that you're saying works? It uh, connects to a bigger picture beyond the noble. Mm -hmm. Beyond the noble? Beyond the no, no Oh, no noble. noble. Beyond the noble. Okay. Okay, let's think again. You're on your path. <coughs> your path is your goal. This is in the, in the old fashioned when we were youngsters view of the world and we were only into telos. We knew that telos was getting us to go in this direction. Okay, so you're saying that tr trust is the ground and the highest form, right? Yeah. And you're saying passion, passion is your ground and the highest form. Yeah. And you're saying that love is the ground and the highest form. And you're saying that death, it's like, bing, 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 bing. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Because that's, in terms of going back to the TV ones, that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? The ultimate goal is to die. Well, no. <laughs> very happy <laughs> class. <laughs> death, <laughs> murder. <laughs> Your conviction is not to die. You know, that's what we're... Your conviction is not to die. So... Heaven and hell. My goodness. Well, okay. I, I don't know. But death is the sort of the end, isn't it? Okay, let's try it again. We're getting there. Yes? Well, I think you mentioned cruelty. I did mention cruelty. I think so. Yes. Last time. Can you elaborate on that? Or I just don't that remember. I, I remember that word. So yes, cruelty is a very interesting word. We'll put it on here. One well, secret. Oops. <coughs> I don't know about you, but after spell check, I couldn't spell anything. Cruelty. Mm -hmm. Death. <laughs> and then on the Mary Poppins side, Trust. <laughs> <laughs> Same as love. Yeah, it's not about Mary Poppins. It's much tougher. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Why is it tougher? Because you're working with the unknowable. How do you do it if not by trust? Okay, I, I asked the jury over here. Is there any way to do something other than by trust? Yes. yes. For those of you that really have a secret, <laughs> you only have half a secret. <laughs> Boy, am I a secret. <laughs> fear. Fear. Fear is always a good motivating factor. Yeah, that always helps motivate. Yeah, Johnny? Temptation. Temptation? <laughs> See, you're getting so warm. I feel like, I mean, I feel like we're going to have to do uh, hangman's again. <laughs> Love. Oh, we're back to love. <laughs> lust. Love. Oh, lust. Sorry. Lust. Love. Longing. Passion. Longing. To gain something? To gain. To gain. <laughs> I like that one. Connection? Yeah, that's my, you know, give me your bank details. <laughs> back to the original thing. What'd you say? Connection. 
<coughs> okay. Desire. Desire. This is Chelsea again? No. No. Oh. <laughs> Unpredictability. Wait, 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 wait. Desire. <laughs> What'd you say? Unpredictability, the not knowing. Oh, yeah, the unpredictable. Unpredictable. Now, okay. Let's try this again. In the beginning of the course, not in the beginning of the world, in the beginning of the course, we heard that we were, we were moderns. To be a modern meant three things. Okay, it meant a lot of things, but for the sake of our discussion, it meant separation of church and state, it meant the rise of the individual, and it meant change, right? Those are the three things. And without those three things, modernity is back in being the Middle Ages, with the Dark Ages. The fact that you could actually think that you personally might be able to make a difference was important. And Kant makes the argument in what time period? The Enlightenment. Just curious. What? The Enlightenment. Sorry, the Enlightenment. Yeah, no, 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 but what time period? Um, 18th century. 18th century. Mm -hmm. And get a smaller date? 13th century. No, not the 13th century. 1790? Oh, Palpitation. <laughs> he, he answers a question. The newspaper, remember this? Mm -hmm. That was long ago, three weeks ago. Okay. And he says about the Enlightenment, when people say, what is this thing called the Enlightenment? And everybody answers various things. He says, it's about daring to know. It's about taking uh, the position that you're mature enough not to go running off to ask daddy or the priest or mommy or whatever it is, what's the answer? And that's the first step of realizing that you know it has nothing to do with trust. That first step. Sorry. Your opinion. No. <laughs> no, not my opinion. This is where we're, we're this is where we're getting at this. I want to get a sense of when is it an opinion and when is it correct. <laughs> okay. Yeah, good luck on that one. <laughs> it's correct if I say so I feel like I'll be yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So as long as we know our place, you know, like, I don't believe that all people are equal in these situations. <laughs> yeah. I trust you. I have a student that uh, once came to me. He was quite an interesting character, um, a very brilliant guy, and uh, he was very angry, very angry student. Um, and he used to walk around the class. He'd never sit down. He, he, was too, he was too anxious. And and I was like, you know, who are you? And what are you doing? Stop it. You know, but anyway, I didn't say anything. I just he just walked around, and at one point he turned to me and said, "I bet you're like one of those kind of lecturers that believes that everybody's equal in the class." I was like, "I never gave you that idea. I don't believe that at all. You know, <laughs> you're the students. I'm the professor. Okay, you may be more intelligent than me, but I know more than you. Okay, yeah, it's like, but that's not an argument, right? That's just an argument of, you know, might is right. You know, power is power, right?" I'm trying to get you to understand how does the thing work as a concept that, or, or to put it slightly differently, how is that concept so real that it's not my opinion versus, you know, Alexander's opinion? How does that work? I say, well, no. You say yes. I say no. I say, you know. No, then we can go really fast so I can say yes and you say no. <laughs> then we get all confused. So the enlightenment begins with the position. It's not the opinion that everyone has reason. Everyone has reason. It's not an opinion. It's the fundamental feature. It's like a position around physics. It's not my opinion that the law of gravity exists. The law of gravity exists. I deal with it. Is that true? Who said that? Oh, no. <laughs> it is the truth, but the truth is a funny thing. As we, the thing about the truth <coughs> is that, as we, as I was trying to explain in the last two lectures, is that it's subjective in this case. And I say in this case, I'm not really trying to overqualify it. I'm trying to say that in this time period that we're talking about, or in this moment that we're talking about, this notion of truth is movable. 
but it's not movable in the sense that it's correct here and not correct there and correct here, not correct there. It's movable in the sense or it's not rigid in the sense that it is a constituent moment. It, it, it's, it's, it's more than, it's not flat. It's not one dimensional truth. A fact has this ball of energy that makes it so. So what grounds any movement, what grounds anything, always has at least these two sides that then becomes a synthesis, right? Back to that. So we know that the ground, to the degree to which there is one in this part of the conversation, the ground is also not flat. So this thing truth, or this thing passion, or this thing love, one has to get a visceral sense of how it operates, a sensuous sense. Without the sensual aspect of how this bit gets together, you're not going to do anything but create boring work. Even math is, is sensuous. I mean, this may come as a big shock, but then you're all sitting down. But it's, it's, it, it, it has visceralness that creates a, a kind of energy that makes things stick. And there's very few things that get the sticky to unstick. Can you think of what those things could be? Death. <laughs> Hana's our death person. <laughs> death. I just point to you. Death. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Death. Death helps you focus the mind. <laughs> what else focuses the mind? Reality? Does reality, but you're in a class right now. <laughs> Half of you are like, what is the point of this? Okay. <laughs> what focuses the mind, really? Context. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get God focuses the mind? Oh. God focuses the mind? Getting depressed now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> knowledge. Does knowledge really focus the mind? Well, yes, in some aspect. How does it focus the mind? Well, it just. If you're open. Does that help you wake up a little bit? Does <laughs> that focus the mind? Uncertainty. What's that? Uncertainty. Okay, if I went up to you and slapped you across the face, <laughs> would that focus your mind a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you already what the hell? <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's several things that have just happened that are all wrong. That's insensitive. You know, it's like the, this person got off the stage, hit you. Okay, you're just sitting there, minding your own beeswax. Suddenly, somebody comes over and slaps you. So, force, always a plus for focusing the mind. Cruelty. Cruelty, another plus. What was that? Risk. Risk. Who said that? Yeah. Risk. Johnny? It's a yeah, world power or selfishness. World power? No, will power. Oh, will, will power. Will power. Yeah, will power. <laughs> will power. It's <laughs> fear. Fear. Okay. I say this with love. Did everybody read Fear and Trembling? Did a few of you read Fear and Trembling? Did anyone read Fear and Trembling? One person read Fear and Trembling. <laughs> okay. And it happens to be Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, it's very important to read this stuff because otherwise it really is like going to the dentist. Okay. Um, and it's not pleasant unless you really like pain. <laughs> Trust me, I can deliver that. Now, I said it again. It has to do. Let me rephrase. Tonight's lecture, let me start again, is about having a secret. Anybody want to tell us what your secret is? Let me try it that way. Does anybody want to tell a secret? Dane, got a secret? Yeah. Can you tell it? Luke. Want to tell a secret? Luke? Luke. <laughs> <laughs> secret. Could I say you belief? Could you save it with belief? Save the, uh, sort of having that people having to admit that you believe 
Do you believe that yeah. you have a secret? No, no, no. So I'm going back to the guessing uh, game. <laughs> um, believing that nobody would find out. You're believing. You're here because you believe. Doesn't anybody have a secret you want to share? Because I'll show you how this works. I can share sure. a secret. Okay. But a real secret. Sure. Okay. Camera on, Alexander. <laughs>
I say this because we're getting closer to what I was trying to get you to think about with the path. These things have weight to them. But the weight isn't just, um, it's, 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 it's not a measurable weight like in a social science sense. And the revealing or the concealing of the secret doesn't alleviate the weight. That's the problem, or that's the, and what, uh, I think that you were, someone over here in this corner was talking about responsibility. I don't want to get overly, you know, pious about this concept of responsibility here, but if you have a secret, and the secret has a weight, the weight, no, I'm sorry, if you have a secret, you're going to have a weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, not as in waiting for you to we're going to have a weight. Nothing will alleviate that weight. Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, later on Heidegger, when we get to it, they're all making an argument, Benjamin, that in order to be in the realm of art, you must grasp the secret that has a weight to it, has, a, has an awful weight. This is not a secret, like a secret love affair, which is happy, let's say. This is a weight, this is a crushing, this is, a, this is something that if you even try and throw it off, it doesn't go anywhere. It keeps you from either closing, sorry, from either closing or opening. It, it is very powerful. That's what I'm talking about. This thing is called, that's what's called the secret. So what you're talking about is a secret. You've told the secret, but you'd have to sort of shout it to the rooftops, and even then, what would it do? Nothing. Because there's something that gets broken in the secret. That's what you need to think of. Something really gets cut. It's cruel that, that she told you this was yeah. both important, yeah. but it was also cruel, that you gave her your word. And it, it has to do with faith, but not faith in the religious sense, and not faith even in the trust sense. Maybe faith is even a crummy word for this. It's a bond of some kind. There's a bond that's been created with a secret. It's this that we're exploring, and this bond, Kierkegaard onward, is naming a singularity. Because this bond doesn't have another side. There is no other side to singularity. Now, maybe when you start thinking, when we get into uh, physics, a certain kind of physics, and we're speaking about one-dimensional objects, whatever, you'll see that in those environments, you can think of a material, a materiality of sorts that doesn't have another side. One dimension, four dimension, speed, something like this. Oh, I have a question to ask you, parenthesis. Last night I couldn't sleep because I was thinking about this lecture. And also, I just couldn't sleep. And so I was listening to an old, uh, not that old, but an old news report on BBC uh, about, um, what's his face, that jumped out the, the, um, the spaceship or the balloon. Um, you know, uh, Felix, Felix Baumgarten, um, who jumped off. And the question was, when you're falling faster than the speed of sound, what happens with sound? Is it behind you? Like if you were screaming, could you hear, or would you hear the sound afterwards? Because you're falling faster than the speed of sound. So when you hit the ground, and then comes the sound. Is that how it works? <coughs> I just ask you this because I'm talking about a singularity there. You're moving off of guilt and shame, going into some other forms of it. But I'll just let that lie for the look at that sound go. Now, uh, back to this secret. Anybody else want to share a secret? Dan, you have any secrets? 
No, but I'd, I'd say something, uh, or I'd add something, one concept, um, which would be doubt yes. into this whole equation, um, and suggest that uh, to be a true secret, um, there has to be a personal sense that you can't doubt. That it is a secret. You can doubt almost anything. Yeah. But you don't, uh, Alexander, you, you have no doubt that this is, you might doubt everything else, but you don't doubt that this is your secret and that it's a way. You, you, you sort of have some kind of um, irredeemable respect for it as unchangeable. Very important. Yeah. Point. Actually, and I, and I, I think doubt could have come with this earlier, but I'm just. I'm just doubt did come earlier. In fact, doubt was in the first lecture. Right. Okay. So it's fair, but but it's good to remind everybody that we dealt with or we, we brought it up because, especially the Cartesian form of doubt, as I had mentioned earlier on, because that's not the same thing as I doubt what you're saying. You know what I was saying. It, it forms a kind of materiality that you need to be thinking through. So again, how the, the certainty that what you have is a secret, but how that certainty is itself unchallengeable. And in the unchallengeability, it still allows one to use it as a uh, lever, almost, as a, as a way to move. Is that how you were referring to it, or did you want to elaborate on the no, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, in the Cartesian, remember, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, is not I have a mind and I have a body. Bad way of looking at that. It has to do with the way in which doubt, you can doubt everything, but you cannot doubt doubt. For, for Descartes, that's as far back as you go with your little going back. You can doubt that the sky is blue, you can doubt this, that. But you can't go further than doubt. But in saying that, that creates certainty. So the cert this is an odd form of the cert it, it, it creates an odd form of positivity. Same with the secret. The secret creates an odd form. I'll tell you a secret. I, this is a secret I had when I was a little kid. Um, we lived in very poor conditions. Uh, or not say very poor, but we, we, we lived in a situation that was uh, a military environment, um, so, so it was kind of odd anyway, uh, but we were living in a civilian uh, environment, and we didn't have a lot of money. We had a lot of food stamps and stuff like, stuff like that going on. And I was really, really hungry. We, we hadn't had, uh, I don't know, hadn't eaten or something. I was just hungry. I remember I was like seven years old or something. And my um, parents asked me, before I sat down, did you wash your hands for dinner? I was so hungry. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I washed my hands. Of course, I hadn't washed my hands. So the secret was that I knew I hadn't washed my hands. And it was basically a lie, because I had lied now. I hadn't washed my hands. And so, they, and I must have looked like I'd just come in from playing, that dirt all over myself, you know. So they said, do, well, if you washed your hands, Show us the towel that you used. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, so we go upstairs together. I'm like, this is just not going to end well. You know, I'm not going to get fed. Okay, that's first problem. Second of all, I'm going to be exposed for having told a lie. Another issue. You know, finally, <coughs> how am I going to get out of this? It's just a disaster. So I go into the bathroom. I find what I hope is one of the dampest washcloths around, which is like bone dry. But you know, I'm figuring, well, it's coming out of the dryer. Nothing ever dries properly in this house, so there's got to be one damp one in here somewhere. I pull it out. I, I send it. I give it to my astonished parents, who are like, "That's bone dry. <laughs> you are lying." Go into uh, a you know, we're sending you to bed, and I, you know, I got it's like, it was not a good scene. I then decided. Here's my secret. I decided I'm going to run away. I was like seven. I just was couldn't handle it anymore. It was just like this is ridiculous. So I climb out the window. 
I let myself down. Now this is at a time period in the U.S. in Michigan with the trees, windows near the trees, climb out and go down. It's just like you think in America. It's like these like trees next to the house. <laughs> Nobody had these issues with the roots taking over the house or something like that. The trees next to the house. Climbed down and I was a tomboy, so yeah, it was a very easy swung down. You know, I was out in the tree. It was like amazing. <laughs> it was like I couldn't believe how easy this was. You know, and then I was thinking, okay, now I must find food. All right, this is like you know, this is my whole reason for being. And I went everywhere looking for food and couldn't find anything. But instead what happened was I ended up going into, as you do, a football stadium, because it was nearby, and ended up watching a fantastic football match. Now meanwhile, I got carried away with this because it was a football game. I mean, American football, you know, it was a little weird football. And I then realized, oh my god, time is of a problem. If they, they might come upstairs, they might not see me in the room, that'll be a whole nother lie I have to deal with. You can wear you get nowhere. <laughs> it's like, yeah. make myself back, get in, realize I can't climb the tree very well because it was easier to fall down than to climb back up. That becomes another whole issue. Rip my clothes, finally get into the room. I'm sitting there, they open the door, and they said, okay, because you've been so good, like, you, know, <laughs> you can now come downstairs for food. I don't know how they didn't notice that I was like, covered in like leaves and like mud, you know, I'll just wash my hands, <laughs> it's like, as I've been taught, you know, and I did that. And I always kept that secret until now. Now, that was a, a sweet secret in a certain sense. There's nothing viscerally horrible about it. But at the age of seven, whatever it was, it was a pretty powerful secret for me. And for years, I felt that I had betrayed the trust of my parents, because I had, really. And I felt horrific. So I eventually decided I would tell them one version of it. This was the full version, quite get to the football games and everything. But then I sort of left the house and come back. And they were still angry. And I realized I should never have told the secret. Because in telling the secret, not only did I not end up unburdening myself, because they still felt that I had betrayed them, <laughs> like, but now, they knew what I had done, and they had reason to believe, to back up the fact that I had betrayed them. So, I tell you this because we all have these kind of secrets. I mean, that was a very simple one. I mean, I certainly have other more interesting ones. But, <laughs> but that one, I use, I give you this example because I want you to really think about the hardcore versions of your heart. Let's say your X-rated porn level, including, in this case, porn. Uh, versions of your secret and how it focuses your world. And in the focusing of your world, how you use that one way or the other to create your path. The secret is part of the exit. And you need to get a sense of how that operates. The secret forms you, informs you, does something around the ways in which something exists. i tell you another secret. This was a military secret, so it was very interesting. I worked for the U.S. State Department at one point. Don't even let's go there. Um, and you have to be clear. We have to have clearance. You have to have a secret from the top secret <coughs> clearance, whatever. Anyway, top secret clearance in the U.S. is like the bottom of the level. It's, you know, they, they go all the way up to kryptonite. It's really quite impressive. Anyway, I have this, uh, this Clearance. My job at the State Department was to convince people that the reason the Panama Canal should be given back to the Panamanians was because the U.S. government was backing the rights of the Panamanians. The real reason, and I can tell you this because it's declassified, the real reason was because the military had built a canal, the U.S. military, I'm sorry, had built nuclear warships that were one foot too wide and couldn't fit through the canal, which is fantastic as an argument. Okay. And so rather than explain that this was the case, they set this whole thing in motion. And this was top secret. I mean, it's top secret at my level, so I mean, it wasn't profoundly secret, but it was secret enough. And it turns out that in finally telling people the secret, Nobody could believe it. 
So the other thing about a secret is a lot of times when you reveal a secret, it depends what it is, but people just go, that's just not true. They just don't believe it. It's just not believable. So the other thing about a secret is that it can be parked in full view. Sometimes a secret can be just sitting right there, camouflage, except it's not all that camouflaged. Sometimes a secret, I don't know how many people have ever known anyone to shoplift. You don't have to admit this. But if you've ever shoplifted, the best way to do it, I've heard, <laughs> is right in plain view. If you do it sort of really secretly and stuff like that, like in that usual cloak and dagger way, you'll get caught. If you do it right in plain view, you can always make the argument, oh, I didn't realize. You know, but <coughs> so is that what you did wrong? Well, <laughs> too furtive. Too, too furtive. No, and I can also tell you another secret that I used to steal. And I went into, I'm going into a shop. You go into a shop and lift up a box of chocolates from behind the counter, and walk out, and no one would notice because it looked like I was supposed to be doing that. In terms of not being furtive. And we used to have these competitions about who could steal the most. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a boxes and boxes of stuff. And one day, my mom went up to the attic and said, what's all these chocolates doing up in the attic? I don't know. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> but okay. my, my question then is, so what is more important than a secret? What enables someone to tell a secret? <clears throat> what enables you to tell your secret? Trust. That's something more important than the secret. And what's more important than the secret? Trust! <laughs> and what is more important than a secret? Nothing. Nothing's more important than a secret. Well, in a the lot sense of people that don't tell their secrets because? Fear. Yeah. But, so being but, fearless is more important? No, because it, it wouldn't matter if the secret... The point is, on one level, it doesn't matter that your secret is told or not told, because it's not going to actually relieve you of the burden of the secret. If it does, it wasn't a secret. Or it wasn't the secret that we're talking about. It wasn't that level of the secret, that visceral. You know, let's say for someone gets their arm chopped off. That is chopped off. It, it's at that level the secret. The secret is something that is so dramatic that if you tell it or you don't tell it, it's got nothing to do with it because it's this, it, that is creating a, a fabric around which something else is happening. But so, isn't it the shame that stops people telling secrets? What? How do, you, how do you get over the shame? Well, okay, that would go back to Kierkegaard. <laughs> okay. Or then we go back to the story of Abraham, which I will begin to read to you again. So, so I just don't, I just, I hope that you are being able to hear this in a way that's not the usual lecture format. I'm trying to summarize what we're doing for the last couple weeks. I thought I was giving you too much in the last couple of weeks. What, um, what Abraham, what, what is asked in the questions, and what Kierkegaard gets into in later on Derrida when you read it, uh, in The Gift of Death, in fact, just while well, I have on the side. Uh, there is a website that you need to go to, which many of you may already know about, called arg.org, www.4as. If you check that in, you will be able to get all books downloaded, no? Yeah, there's all the problem now, I've known this, everything's, everything's now, like ever since the FBI moved in and got rid of Mirror. No, no, there's a way around that. There's a couple, but most of the stuff I was looking at, most of it's just gone. No, but you can so now, actually what you do is you uh, take the URL, you don't set up a new tab, you put it in the same uh, window as it was before, and it'll reopen, it'll open and download it. Still doesn't work Mirror Upload. A lot of stuff that's been just lost. Well, I can tell you that Kierkegaard, Is the gift of death, oh, okay. and the things that are dealing with this course <laughs> are definitely available on that website. Um, 
in that way. You might get an oops 538 or whatever it's called, 568, 565 uh, remark that says can't open it, disaster, this contravenes, you know, the Helsinki Agreement of 1790 or whatever. You might get that, but if you do get that message, you just cut and paste the URL. You don't set up a new window. You just put it into the Google bar of the old window and it'll download it. And anybody that still has questions, ask Grace. <laughs> so I will explain to Grace how to do it. No, I'm just kidding. Just send me, I'll send you the link so you can know exactly how to do it. They, there's a whole YouTube discussion going on where they actually show you how to do this because a lot of people are having this problem. Anyway, ARD will allow you to down, download it. So if you haven't been doing the reading because you haven't either bought the book or had the book or whatever the story is, now there's no excuse. Okay, now you can go to ARD and get it or you can go to Moodle, which hopefully is uploaded there. Okay, Kierkegaard stroke Abraham, and later Derrida, which I'll get into now in a minute. Sorry, it's took one of my thoughts. Is basically making the argument that there's two arguments. The first argument is what Abraham was doing was that defensible. Remember, that was what we talked about last week. And the argument became kind of, but there's an, a teleological suspension of the ethical. And from that, we got into the whole discussion about how doubt, submission, mastery starts playing into the equation and how that can't be outside of the sexual, the sensuous, the visceral, the dirty. That was last week. We'll, we'll, we can return to that. That's the first part of that question. The second part of the question is the actual holding of the secret. So one is kind of like, let's say, the content, and the other is, for a better or worse way, but it the form. One is what's inside the secret, the secret that Abraham actually had, and the second is the fact of the secret. Can you reveal the secret? And the answer involves whether or not there is really a secret. So part of the answer to is there really a secret is that in the revealing of the secret, it doesn't change anything. At most, somebody can get mad at you or not mad at you, but the fact of the secret, what it does to yourself, is not revealable. It, it forms a condition, a condition of your living. It conditions you. It's a condition, like there are seven conditions to life. This is one of your conditions. The human condition. It conditions, it air conditions. It's con it, it, it conditions how you are. And this conditioning is what Abraham can't get off, get rid of, and, which is why our Jews Kierkegaard, in fact, all of the prophets and goddess, whoever else is involved in the story, why Abraham anyway becomes the founder of you know the whole Jewish uh, move and you know the whole thing about being separate and kosher and and able to be uh, sacrificed and or pure you know whatever separate separated it, it it's not because he didn't tell the secret it's not because things went really well and he just you know it turned out that God stepped in no. It was the secret wasn't revealable and it wasn't concealable. It existed as a, as a side that creates an ability for movement to occur that is not predictable. And that is not not predictable. So movement normally in the in the Enlightenment sense, in the modern sense, has a prediction to it. One, two, three, next number four. You know that you know the systems, you know how that can go. But if you're talking about the aesthetic move, if you're talking about this level, you need to have a sense of how movement occurs viscerally, painfully, uh, What's the right way of putting it? Yeah. Some kind of energy involved that matters, that makes matter happen, that matters, that, that creates a matter somehow. 
and it begins in the discussion in this time period of how the secret begins to build this question so far. I feel like I feel like there's too many type in. Yeah. One, one aspect of it that's completely confusing me, and you could just say, you just don't worry about that now, which is my like, daughter. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, he layers up his lie, doesn't he? Because he tells the lie to the son as well. And then Kierkegaard starts talking about the, the whole thing about breastfeeding and a lie being involved in that. And I, I got very, very confused. That's the bit that's I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on. Sort of but he doesn't lie to his son. Well, he, so he, sort of, he, he sidesteps it. Okay, maybe he's economical with the truth. Doesn't he do something where he tries to encourage his son to think that he's mean? Yeah. But in no way does he say that that he, he, in no way does he not tell the son, basically, you're going to die. He might say there's different reasons for it. I'm insane. Yeah, I don't love you anymore. You're an idiot. Whatever. But he's not lying at the level. And he even says it's God's will. He just tries to ameliorate it by saying, look, for whatever reasons, it's really me. Don't, don't, blame, don't blame the big guy. It's me. But the real question is, why does Kierkegaard go into this whole breast thing? Yeah, yeah that's the bit. What is it about the breast that starts becoming, what is this, you know, blackening the breast, making sure there's food somewhere else, you know, you know, like someone has really hurt themselves and you step on their foot so that they now concentrate somewhere else. What is it about this breast thing? What's he talking about? What happens when you get weaned, as they say? So we start trying to make some of their own effects. And what does that require? Stopping their life, relying on you or somebody else. Wait, I heard the word over there. Separation. Separation, who said that? Ah, oh, Joe, yes. yes. Separation. Separate, the word kosher, for example, means separate. So people that keep kosher, that's what that word is about. The Jewish people see themselves as separate. What's this thing about separate? What is it when one is separate but still connected to a community, for example? What happens if you're separate and still connected to a community? You can individuate. What's that? You can individuate. Yeah, you can, you can individuate, let's say, some form of a decision, but it's an undecidable decision. This is, which I was going to now get into after we have our little break, but the decision to be able to create a break, a break with anything you love, including your life, including the most precious thing, requires an act of cruelty. That's the bottom line. Now, that act of cruelty, it doesn't mean if you say to a child, the stove is hot, and when you say that, you take the hand of the child and you put it on the stove and see, it's hot. It's not that level of cruelty. It's, what's that? You sneezed. Yeah. <laughs> it's a level of cruelty that requires a cut. The cut, this deep cut, this surface cut, some kind of cut. Uh, and this is, I'm going to tell you a secret, and the secret is there's a cut. Do you get that secret? Yeah. Do you get why we're even having this one hour's worth or an hour and a half worth of this thing? Nope. You're thinking to yourself, this is not like the normal lectures where there's a beginning, middle, and end. There's something happening here, something weird. This is like a, a Ouija board thing going on. Yes? Oh, scratching. Oh, scratching. <laughs> so, so, in your mind, we're, we're going to take a five minute break. So I think that if we don't, we might die. Um, there is a secret. We have yet to figure out what this means. I fear that it's partly to do with the fact that people haven't had a real chance to read. Maybe not. 
secret. A couple, couple of you have literally shared your secret, come up with another secret. When we come back, we'll only spend another 30 minutes on decidabilities. And then I swear to you, after you also read this work, we return next week to a much more nuts and bolts thing. So you feel more comfortable about that. We can go back to telos and dialectics whatever, consciousness, although it does still get worse, but you just need to think in your minds, what the heck is this secret about? Why do we need to worry about a secret? What does it have to do with art? What does it have to do with life? Why is this part of an analysis, and how is it not an opinion? <laughs> you know, how is it like something else that forms a path? How, how does that work? That's what you need to think about. Okay, take a five minute break. And then I take a five minute break. Cigarettes, Diet Coke, coffee. See how that goes.
Anyway, the one on the, on the uh, right is the edge of death, as you can now see. Um, both downloaded from R. For the unbelievers in the room, in the room. Okay. So the last hour we spent going around in circles in a certain sense. But at least I, I hope trying to break the ground a little bit so you can sort of play with it. I'm putting up these two texts side by side so that you can um, get a sense of the different ways that this is happening. Uh, the one on the right is from Derrida. It's from Gift of Death. Uh, it's downloadable. Luke? Okay, Just kidding. Right. <laughs> from ARC. But in any case, um, we'll, we'll get back to that. That's, that's Derrida. And he's in, in that chapter in The Gift of Death. He's, it's direct reference to Kierkegaard, so that's why I have you looking at it. And here, this is the first version of uh, an explanation of why this is not to be read, as Simon was asking earlier during the break, as an anthropological approach to, you know, well, at that time people had sacrifices and God was intervening to show you that was a stupid thing to do or it was wrong or this, we, you know, now you must be, you know, uh, human or whatever things. What, what Kierkegaard is saying is something much more, he's using this uh, Abraham story in part to raise the question of what does it mean to submit to something that allows for creativity to flourish. He, he's talking about a very specific kind of submission. I keep mentioning this. It's a submission, I said it before, the submission of the bended knee, but this is not a submission done out of, um, of fear in the sense of being afraid of God and God's going to rise up and slap you across the face and say, bad person. It's not done for that reason. It's a submission because it must be done. Like when you're doing your artwork. Like when you are caught in whatever it is you're, you're working on, and you're caught in it, like rabbits in a headlight or that expression, you know, you're caught, not because you have an opinion, I want to be caught, I don't want to be caught, but because you must be doing it. For those of you that are immigrants that have come over from somewhere, or those of you that have just never had the chance to study and now you are, whatever, whatever it is that got you here, that crossed whatever mountains you had to cross, didn't know you're going to end up in this room at this time at seven o'clock at night on a Thursday night. That got you here. There was no thing that said, you know, in the year 2012, in October, you will end up here at seven o'clock. Listening. No, you didn't have that level of the of the map. Something got you here. Now, obviously, I'm not trying to elevate this class to the level of, you know sacrificing, you know, first born or something like that. What I'm trying to get you to think about is what is it that gets you on your path in a way that is not driven from fear as it, or cruelty at the level of I want to hurt people, that's what's my path. The path that what's cruel is that you are being the subject of the, of the cruelty, as it were. You are submitting. Voluntarily, actually. This is the secret. This is the, the real secret. The bigger secret. <coughs> the bigger secret is that you have agreed to submit. It's the only way you can learn, actually. I don't know if you've ever been in situations where people are supposedly, quote, unteachable or un, you know, something like that, the famous problem of being unteachable, that's when people aren't willing to submit. And by that, I don't mean being obedient. In fact, I mean exactly the reverse. I mean they're not willing to put themselves on the line. If you're not willing to put yourself on the line, you're not going to learn. You're just not. And that's what, that's what Kierkegaard says. So he starts off here. Oh, I'm sure the same way. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> it says here, in the very beginning, it says, from the external and visible world there comes an old adage, only one who works gets bread. Oddly enough, the adage does not fit the world in which it is at most home. For imperfection is the fundamental law of the external world, and here it happens again and again that he who does not work does not he who does not work does get bread. So he's in a little swipe at the upper classes, basically. He who does work, does not work does get bread, and he who sleeps gets it even more abundantly than he who works. So you see, this is his little critique of, of the current environment he's in. In the external world, i.e. in the real world of you know how horrible it is to live in Denmark at this point, everything, or in fact the Western world, everything belongs to the possessor. It is subject to the law of indifference, and the spirit of the ring, you know, that is the kissing of the king's ring, obeys the one who has the ring, whether he is an Aladdin or an Oradenin, and he who has the wealth the word of the world has it regardless of how he got it. Bitter, twisted, evil queen. It is different in the world of spirit. Now, by spirit, he's not necessarily meaning here religion. He's meaning, as Chelsea pointed out, the passion. He's meaning but a very specific kind of spirit, a knowledge spirit. I don't mean like a ghost knowledge spirit. I don't mean spirit in that sense. I mean that the spirit is based in reason, not in, but, but again, it's not the reason, it's not rational reason. It's not the rationale. It's a logic. I'll get back to that. It is different in the world of spirit. Here, an eternal divine here, an eternal divine order prevails. Now, here, here he is talking about God in that sense. Here, it does not rain on both the just and the unjust. Here, the sun does not shine on both good and evil. Here, it holds true that only the one who works gets bread. Only the one who kneels. Only the one who submits. Only the one who's willing to go to the wall gets the bread that only the one who, had, who was in anxiety finds rest, that only one who, who descends into the lower world rescues the beloved, that only the one who draws the knife gets Isaac. He who will not work does not get bread. Sorry. Oops. Very complicated, sorry. He who will not work does not get bread, but is deceived, just as the gods deceived Orpheus with an, eth with an ethereal phantom instead of the beloved, deceived him because he was soft, not boldly brave, deceived him because he was a zither player and not a man. <laughs> Here it does not help to have Abraham as father or to have 17 ancestors. The one who will not work, the one who does not know what it is to bleed won't get, won't get there. And we started with the question of how do you get out of here? This is the question. How do we get out of here? I move, I'm, I'm here's here, I'm here, I'm still here, I'm still here is always with me. How do I get out of here? Here, here, here. How do you get there? How do you actually move? He's saying something about this. this requirement to understand this, this, this way of which he calls getting bread. And then he goes on. The story about Abraham is remarkable in that it is always glorious no matter how poorly it is understood. Swipe it, Kant. But here again it is a matter of whether or not we are willing to work and be burdened. But we are unwilling to work and yet we want to understand the story. We glorify Abraham, but how? We recite the whole story in cliches. The great thing was that he loved God. So on and so on. In such a way he was offering the best. He goes on. He goes on. He says, this is just not the story. This is really not the story. He keeps going on. He says, um, sorry, it's Mark. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it should be. He says that, and this is why I was asking you, probably not a three. I don't know if I get it. Okay. 
He says, if you're going to understand the story, as he's trying to get you to think about it, he asked the first question, is it defensible that he concealed his understanding from Sarah and the rest of the crowd? And the argument he gives is that it couldn't not be concealed, and it couldn't not be revealed. And he says here, where he starts criticizing Hegel, the ethical as such is the universal, and the universal it is, in turn, the disclosed. The ethical as such is the universal, and, a, and as the universal, it is made obvious, it's made full, it's made completely clear. But we're talking about a secret. We're not talking about something that's disclosed. We're talking about something that's hidden. The single individual qualified as immediate, sensate, and psychical is hidden. Thus, his ethical task is to work himself out of the hiddenness and to become disclosed. But he's saying it can't happen. Every time he desires to do so, he, he desires to remain in the hidden. He trespasses and is immersed in the spiritual trial from which he can emerge only by disclosing himself. Once again, we stand at the same point. If there is no hiddenness rooted in the fact that the single individual, as the single individual, is higher than the universal, then Abraham's contact, conduct cannot be defended, for he, is dis, for he disregarded the intermediate ethical agents. But if there is such a hiddenness, then we face the paradox, which, we can, which cannot be mediated, since it is based precisely on this. The single individual as the single individual is higher than the universal, whereas the universal is in fact the mediation. The Hegelian philosophy assumes <coughs> no justified hiddenness, no justified incommensurability. It is then consistent for it to demand disclosure. So just keep looking at that for the time being. I want you now to just think about how the universal acts as the mediation. Remember the word sublation I was saying? The universal is acting as this movable feast. For Heidegger, and later for Foucault, they're going to take that movable feast and start calling it something like discourse, word you've heard in other context. But if you just keep that there, if you can just move that slightly to the side, so you can still see it. And we put on now Derrida's response. Derrida says, let's just keep that hovering for a moment. And Derrida says, what he does with regard to name the story, fear and trembling. He doesn't name it learning how to become, learning how to hold a secret. He calls it fear and trembling. And Derrida wants to understand what is it about this tremble? Because Derrida's going to push it even further. You've got a secret. You're going to keep it hidden. The only way it's going to work for you is in the tremble. The only time you know you've got something is that you feel the little hairs in your arm begin to move. There's a tremble. And he makes this comment. Now, the, the, this is the, what the secret does. He says, Mysterium Tremendum. Whom to give to? Who, to whom are you kneeling? Who are you giving over yourself? Knowing not to know. Knowing, choosing not to know. Not choosing to be stupid. I mean, not, I don't mean stupid. Well, not, not choosing to be, I just don't want to know. I want to be ignorant. No, no, not that. It's choosing, it's willfully, knowingly choosing that you want to go on a different path, a different knowledge path. So choosing not to know in the rational, logistical, zero-sum game. Choosing to know in the undecidable version. And so he says, a frightful mystery, a secret to make you tremble. <coughs> tremble. What does one do when one trembles? What is it that makes that hair move on your arms, on the neck? What is it that makes you tremble? A secret always makes you tremble. Not simply quiver or shiver 
which also happens sometimes, but to tremble. A quiver can, of course, manifest fear, anguish, apprehension of death. Cue Anna. A quiver can, of course, manifest fear, anguish, apprehension of death, as when one quivers in as when one quivers in advance. As when one quivers in advance in anticipation of what is to come. But they're not talking about what is to come. Art, this thing that we're talking about, this elusive thing at the moment, is not about what is to come. You're not like, oh, today I'm going to go painting. No. But it can be slight. On the surface of the skin, like a quiver that announces the arrival of pleasure or an orgasm, it is a moment in passing, the suspended time of seduction. A secret always makes you tremble. Not simply quiver or shiver, which also happens sometimes, but to tremble. A quiver can, of course, manifest fear, anguish, apprehension of death, as when one quivers in advance in anticipation of what is to come. But it can be slight on the surface of the skin, like a quiver that announces the arrival of pleasure or an act or an orgasm. It is a moment in passing, the suspended time of seduction. A quiver is not always very serious. It is sometimes discreet barely discernible, somewhat epiphenomenal. It prepares for rather than follows the event. It prepares you for rather than comes after the event. One could say that the water quivers before it boils. That is the idea I was referring to as seduction, a superficial pre-boil, a preliminary and visible agitation. On the other hand, trembling, at least as a signal or a symptom, is something that has already taken place, as in the case of an earthquake, tremblement des terres, sorry for my French, or when one trembles all over, it is no longer preliminary, even if unsettling everything so far as it imprints upon the body. prints upon the body an irrepressible shaking, the event that makes one tremble, portends and threatens still. It suggests that violence is going to break out again, that some traumatism will insist on being repeated. As different as dread, fear, anxiety, terror, panic, or anguish remain from one another, they have already begun in their trembling. And what has provoked them continues or threatens to continue to make us tremble. Most often, we neither know what is coming upon us nor see its origin. It therefore remains a secret. We are afraid of the fear. We anguish over the anguish, and we tremble. We tremble in that strange repetition that ties us, that ties an irrefutable past, a shock that has been felt, a traumatism that has already affected us, to a future that cannot be anticipated to a future that cannot be anticipated. Anticipated, but unpredictable. Apprehended, but, and this is why there is a future, apprehended precisely as unforeseeable. Apprehended precisely as unforeseeable. Unpredictable, approached as unapproachable. Even if one thinks one knows what is going to happen, a new instant of that happening remains untouched, still inaccessible, in fact, unlivable. In this, in the rep, sorry, the repetition of what still remains unpredictable, we tremble, first of all, because we don't know from which direction the shock came, whence it was given, whether a good surprise or a bad shock, sometimes the surprise received as a shock, and we tremble from not knowing in the form of a double secret, whether it is going to continue, start again, insist, be repeated, whether it will be, how it will be, where it will be, when it will be, and why this shock 
Hence I tremble, because I am still afraid of what already made me afraid, of what I can neither see nor foresee. I tremble at what exceeds my seeing and my knowing, although it concerns the innermost parts of me, right down to my soul, down to the bone, as we say. Inasmuch as it tends to undo both seeing and knowing, trembling is indeed an experience of secrecy or mystery, but another secret, another enigma, or, an, or another mystery comes on top of that. And what do you think that is? What is that other thing that creates this, this, this trembling? Does anybody have that when you're facing your own work? Does anybody tremble before? I hope so. I hope so, that, that there's something that gives you at least, I mean, as I'm telling you this, I have goosebumps, that's quite weird. The tremble is this moment of undecidability, but it doesn't mean, I don't know what I'm doing. It's not that level of undecided. Just like the Cartesian form of doubt doesn't mean, I don't believe what you're saying. I don't believe in this. I don't, I don't agree. It's not that form of doubt. It's, a, it's an undecidability that requires, as Derrida's putting it, this double secret. As Kierkegaard would put it, the singularity, this moment of intensity where you submit because you have no other choice but to, but it's not a submission out of fear, out of exasperation. The holding of the secret and whether or not you reveal the secret, now that may be because of fear. But the real secret is the secret that you must submit. That's the secret. And whether you do submit or not is up to you. I tell you this. I've now told you the secret. Some of you can hear it, some of you can't. Some of you know it, some of you won't. It's a certain kind of what Kierkegaard is calling faith, but we could possibly call it this undecidability. Later on, it could even be called a form of complexity. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm just trying to give you passageways. It's this tremble. Kierkegaard calls the story fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. It's not that you have to go around thinking, I'm not feeling the tremble, I'm not feeling it. You know, when am I going to feel it? Obviously, I'm not being an artist. It, it's not like that. It's that when you're caught by what you're working on, and it works, and you don't know why, don't ask the why question. The why question will only bring you back to God, as I've said over and again. Why is this room here? Because they built it in 1885, or whenever they built it. Why did they build it? Because they thought Birmingham should have a school of art. Why should Birmingham have a school of art? Because there are a lot of people that liked art. Why were there a lot of people who liked art? Well, because God. You know, at the end, you know, how far back do you have to go before you just say, the why question leads you to one place, and that place only, and that is God. And even in the, in the parable of God to Abraham, God is not asking Abraham to ask why. Because if you ask the why question, you will only ever kneel to authority, to the Archimedean point that then tells you how to go. So it's not even that God is saying to Abraham, kill your son. It's the, it's the moment that he's going in there, that he's doing in, quote, good faith, because there is no other faith to have. It's not, he's not talking about Sartre and bad faith. It's not talking about any of that. It's just, it's just faith is good faith. Just, there's no anti in there. And he's going in this direction. And, and this is this moment of both undecidability, which doesn't mean I can't make up my mind. I have no idea. It has to do with the fact that it's not written in a static form. And, and when that works, the little hairs on your back should rise. This is the tremble. This is the moment when, for no other reason, you're saying, well, that seems to work. I don't know why. It just is. It, the is is present. 
like getting there a little bit. So we've got a couple nods. Do what are you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> Undecided one. Let's try one more thing. Oh, yeah. oh, why is it so late? Sorry. Okay, let me just take it down <clears throat> here. So he says here, uh, Derrida says here, I tremble at what exceeds my seeing and my knowing, although it concerns the innermost parts of me, right down to my soul, down to the bone, as we say, inasmuch as it tends to undo both seeing and knowing. Trembling is indeed an experience of secrecy or of mystery. But there's another secret. It's the secret that this is the secret. Another enigma or another mystery comes on top of the unlivable experience, adding yet another seal of concealment to the tremor. The Latin word for trembling, for tremo, which in Greek, as in Latin, means I tremble. I am afflicted by trembling. In Greek, there's also the tromeo, I tremble, I shiver, I'm afraid, and traumas, which means trembling, fear, fright. In Latin, tremendous, tremendum, as in mysterium, tremendum. It is a gerundi, sorry, derived from tremo. What makes one tremble? Something frightening, distressing, terrifying. Where does this supplementary seal come from? One doesn't know why one trembles. This limit to knowledge no longer only relates to the cause or unknown event. It has to, it relates to something else. Why does terror make us tremble? Since one can also tremble with cold and analogous physiological manifestations and so on and so forth. What is it about this form of the tremble that is important? He, he ends up by saying, what is it a metaphor or figure for? What does the body mean to say by trembling or crying, presuming one can speak here of a body or of saying, of meaning, and of rhetoric? What is it that makes us tremble? And as love. It is the gift of infinite love. And now he gets into a very odd point. He begins to say that this gift of love is not just, it's not this form of love. It is a form, maybe it is a form of trust at the level of love where one is presenting a positivity. But it's not that one trusts and therefore they go. They go and trust is created. Something like that. There's just one little part I'm going to leave you with because we have to end. In your minds, what we're going to do next week is just go over this again and then, and then stick in the next little bit, which is consciousness. And we're, all, we're getting all the pieces of the puzzle down here. Go over in your notes. Singularity, telos, ground, secret, tremble, and see where it takes you. See if you can shut your eyes, as a, let's say as a homework assignment, shut your eyes and see what it is that you can envision that makes you tremble. Just try it as a little game. Um, so, you know on November 8th, the famous book review is due. Yeah. I really recommend reading Fear and Trembling, seeing that we're going through it. But you don't have to. Um, it's not I like or don't like the book. It's really getting to what is the gist of the argument. That's what you're being asked to look at. What is the gist of the, what's being said? Explain how they devise it, how they make it go forward. Um, and to also say that on the Thursday of the 8th, that, that Thursday, I'm on annual leave. Okay? Because I'm finishing up some work. I've taken off my annual leave. So just that week, I won't be there. Just so you know, so you know in advance. Um, we can still meet. Or people can still be here to meet. Um, we have like a little discussion. But that, that's what's going on. Any questions so far?
How, how academically referenced is the book that we have to do? Academically referenced. Chicago reference. Um, we're used to a different reference thing. A lot of us haven't done Chicago at all. Do you, is that the only one that you want? Okay. Um, and also, um, mm -hmm. the dyslexics get it on the, for the 15th. I know, the, the dyslexics get it, you know, additional yeah. thing. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. Look up Chicago referencing. Chicago referencing, I find, a lot better than the Harvard version, which is whatever they call it here, sociological or whatever, because it doesn't interrupt the text. Like, I think it's so irritating to be reading along and it says, you know, Henry, 1969, one. And it's like, just, just you know, a little discreet little number you can go down the bottom of the page. Also, the nice thing about um, Chicago referencing is that if you want to go on and explain something, you can without your, you know, interrupting your own argument. If you have any questions about how to footnote, come see me. I really am quite obsessive about this particular part. part. Okay? But also, anything on, on the web will tell you how to add a footnote like this. Chicago, robust, yes. Uh, do we have to tell you this? Unless you're struggling and you want some, you know, guidance. Um, how many copies would you like? Is it usually how many copies? Just is it free? <laughs> because usually in the past when we've handed in essays and we've we've had to give in three copies. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. God. <laughs> Why? Different. That's right. Yeah, I have one. I guess three. That's the normal way it's done. In the office. It's one for you. One for you. Oh, thank you. And one for the second marker. Oh, right. So it's only if you want it external to, to read them and take them off to read them that you need It's just, just for you, then one. Well, but I guess an external wants to read them, right? Yeah. So yeah, so do do three copies. Can you afford three copies? I mean, I just think it's like such a waste of forest, but um, I mean, is it that you can't write on these things? And then, so the, the second review. There's just the speed so that they can be sent out. To oh, I see. Okay. It's not when eventually it's done online, that won't be an issue. But, but isn't that isn't that the facility assessed? Is it is book reviews? Is oh, that's true. This book reviews not being assessed. Well done. Okay, so we only need one copy. Yeah, that's me. Okay. See you. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>